So as 2025 comes to a close, I thought I'd share a couple of my predictions and ramblings about 3D printing and what I expect to see like next year and potentially beyond as well. So be interested to know what your thoughts are as well. If you've got any thoughts about what you think is going to happen in 2026 when it comes to FDM and resin 3D printing, throw them down in the comments below. So first up, let's get resin out of the way just because I feel like this is the least interesting of the two. For the most part, I feel like resin 3D printing has hit a bit of a wall in the fact they can't particularly evolve much from its current form factor because it just has limiting factors at the end of the day. I think realistically from resin manufacturers, what we're going to see is more of their unique features and some more gimmicky features as well. And by that, I mean things like the tilting screen that we've got from Elegoo, the pulsing module from Hages, and then when we come to gimmicky stuff, Things like the new Anycubic machine with the dual vat that they've got so you can print in multicolor. Yeah, that sort of thing that advertises to users to be like, hey, look, we're different and we've got something that's a bit more unique than some of the other brands. Of course, the one thing we can always rely on when it comes to resin 3D printers is the increase of resolution on their screens because it's just such a, a flashy, gimmicky number that they can use in terms of advertising. It doesn't really make much of a difference, if any, when it comes down to it, but they like to advertise that. However, the big thing that I'm most interested about on resin 3D printing, I feel is that we will see a lot more quality of life things coming across to all of the printers, and this just becoming a default on any printer, regardless if it's really budget or through to the high end. Stuff like Wi-Fi connectivity, the ability to sync your machine and all the files and everything from the machine to your laptop, to your phone or whatever, to be able to check on it remotely, have heating built in as well, because that's such a big thing to have, and if it doesn't have it, then it's, it's just very frustrating and it's a missed opportunity. I think we'll start to see a lot of these quality of life things land on pretty much all of those printers there and those who don't have it will just miss out on terms of sales. The bigger thing that I think we will see a lot more of, although it won't make a huge amount of difference to miniature printers, is the rollout of safe resin. So we are starting to see this this year. We have seen a couple of those safe resins come through to the market. They're advertised as safer resins rather than safe resins because they're still not safe to touch. However, I think we will start to see a lot more manufacturers and resin producers bring this to market and have their own versions of this. I also feel as though we will see them become better quality as well. So they will become more flexible, more drop resistant and stuff like that. So they will be better placed for miniature printers as well who are looking for a safer environment and safer resin, but also with something that has a bit more drop impact resistance. However, I don't think we're gonna see these compete with the current flexible resins at the moment that are on the market because they're just fantastic. There are some really, really good flexible and engineering type resins that work amazingly well when it comes to miniatures. So it'll be interesting to see there. But apart from that, like I said, I don't think there'll be huge amounts that change when it comes to resin because it is limited ultimately by the way that it works at the moment. Moving across onto FDM, and I think that the machines themselves won't change that much. It feels like pretty much all manufacturers now are settled on Core XY. We start to see some really good well-priced Core XY machines as well, and pretty much every manufacturer now has their own version. Those who don't have that have at least announced they've got one coming. Look at Frozen, for example. Mind you, theirs has been coming for like, like two years now, and it still isn't on the market. But I think we'll start to see pretty much every manufacturer of printers start to have some kind of Core XY machine. I think they'll also come in multiple sizes as well, because the market has shown that they want that choice of having smaller to larger machines. So let's see what happens there. As part of these machines as well, I believe we'll see much better software integration and hardware integration between the machine itself and the application. If there's one thing that Bamboo Lab has really, really demonstrated is that for mass adoption within the consumer space at least, people want something that just works. They wanna be able to download an application on their phone, on their laptop, on their iPad, or whatever, and download the models and send it straight over to the machine and have very little tinkering. So I think we will start to see a lot more of that from all the different manufacturers. And there's another reason for this as well, which I'll come on to shortly. However, the big thing we will see is the battle of multi-material and multi-color printing from this. So we're already seeing this, but I think it's pretty certain that next year will be the year for multi-material and multi-color printing. My thoughts will see the budget machines with everything built in. So like the Carbon Centauri 2, which has basically, it's all built into that one machine. You don't have a separate unit. So you just buy a cheap budget machine that's capable of multi-material printing. You'll then have like your mid-range machines that use the current things like the AMS from Bamboo Lab, the MMS as well. So there's all sorts of things which come with like a, a separate tool, which 
stores loads of filament in it and it feeds it into the machine. But then we'll start to see your premium machines and premium offerings as well with like your tool changes. So the SatMaker U1, for example, Bamboo Labs H2C, and obviously as well, the newly announced INDX by Bontech. There's gonna be a whole range of those things that are really gonna come to mass market next year. Be really interesting to see what ends up being, I suppose, the winner and the thing that is adopted the most. But realistically, I think we're gonna see a lot in terms of multi-material printing. Apparently that's the thing that people really, really like. So let's see where this goes. Anyway, moving across from the hardware side of it, let's talk about software. This is the bit that will probably ruffle a few feathers. I hope I'm wrong with this, but I think that we will either see it next year or at the very least the year after, and that is that subscriptions are coming for our 3D printers. Now, I've got a couple of reasons why I think this, and the first one is you just need to look at the software offerings. So we're seeing slices with more and more capability, and especially when it comes to the cloud space, for example, Hages gives me the option to slice my files. I can store up to 20 of these in the cloud. I can then go over to my machine, and if I had multiple Hages machines, for example, I can download those sliced files from the cloud. And I don't know why I'm dancing at the moment for that. So I can then select my project, pull it down from the cloud, and start printing it as well. But I can only store up to 20 of those. Bamboo Lab has the ability to cloud sync to my printer as well. And it also has loads of stuff that you can store in the cloud. And there's a lot of cloud functionality when it comes to Bamboo Lab. And in my opinion, what we're seeing at the moment is features that exist to hook the user, to get them used to using that. For example, like with Hages, to get me used to slicing and using the cloud, to slice in the cloud as well, so I don't have to rely on local hardware. And then just be able to send all my projects over to my printer. A lot of stuff there that exists to hook the user, to get them used to it. And that leads me on to thinking there's gonna be some future offerings. Anyone who follows tech closely will have seen this happen over and over again. You just need to look at the likes of Apple, for example. They offer the basic little iCloud with five gigabytes of storage. But then if you want more to back up your phone, for example, to back up all your photos, you start paying a little bit more. And then when you're paying more, then suddenly, oh, you can actually have all these additional offerings as well, like Apple TV and subscription-based bits, and then you bump up your subscription slowly and slowly, slowly. I mean, if you just imagine it, you're a prosumer who has a number of slice files that you normally print to order. Well, now they're all based in the cloud and you can move them back and forth between different machines with ease through the cloud, but obviously for a small monthly subscription. The other part of it is the rise of AI and anyone who lives right now has heard of AI. It's the big thing, it's the big flagship thing. It gets investors, it gets money. Every company likes to scream and shout about this. And we've seen Lychee take a swing, and it has obviously been received with mixed reviews by the community, but I don't think it'll be long before other slicers integrate this sort of mechanism and probably include it in their cloud subscription package as well. I don't know what that will look like, whether or not that will be generative AI for your models or AI for support or AI printing monitoring, for example, that will take advantage of all those AI features that are now coming out in your 3D printers that are monitoring your print quality and the monitoring all of that, whether or not that will eventually become chargeable, I don't know. But I do think we'll see a lot more in terms of AI that will then get packaged up with this sort of subscription. So I suppose the question is, why do I think it's coming? And first, it's just a natural evolution of tech. Like I mentioned, it seems to be where every sort of tech company ends up. And I feel as though this is gonna be the same sort of thing. And ultimately for good reason, it makes a lot of money and it gives a lucrative stream of revenue. And if there's one thing that companies like, it's a lucrative stream of revenue. They like money. They're not here just to do it for nonprofit. They're not here just to do it because they like doing this. Some of them might have some very, very passionate people behind the scenes that are very, very good at what they do and they love doing it. But at the end of the day, the company exists to make money and this is an extra stream of revenue for them. Ultimately, the 3D printing market is only so large and you can only reach so many people. And with the current economic issues, and I don't wanna get political for this bit, but ultimately we do need to touch on it briefly. So the, the economic climate at the moment with regards to tariffs and shipping uncertainties means that it's probably gonna be a slowdown in terms of shipments, but more importantly, a decision by some brands and manufacturers about where do they actually price their hardware? How much does it cost? Because they've then got to consider all these additional costs that might be incurred by them. Do they bump up the printer price and therefore potentially lose some of their customers? Or do they somehow subsidize their device? But then how do they subsidize that device? Currently, they can't really subsidize the hardware because they don't have something that they can sell as an additional like consumable that makes up for that cost. They may make some money back through like resin sales, 
but realistically, all of the printer manufacturer resins, so the likes of Elgo, for example, or any cubic, those that make printers and also resin, the resins aren't, at least in my opinion and experience, they're not as good as other types of resin that you can get that are made for like miniatures, for example. There are better resins out there, so they're not gonna make up a huge amount of extra income because of that. So if you throw in some subscriptions, then the bottom line is protected and it gives a little bit more certainty to their future. So it therefore allows them to subsidize some of that hardware so they can either make additional sales and break into the market a little bit more or cover some of those costs that might be incurred through shipping and everything else that's happening at the moment. There's also the part where cloud-based services do cost money to run and that's just, unfortunately, it's a reality. They've got to have all of the cloud-based bits, you've got to have all of this, like the hosting side of it. It costs money to do. So right now, as manufacturers are trying to build their user base, they can afford to take the loss and expense this to gain more users, but there does come a tipping point where that cost becomes too much and they've got to make up for that lost revenue as well. So that's also something to consider. So I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on this and what you would be willing to pay for if you'd be willing to pay for anything at all when it comes to a subscription. So my opinion is that if they do this in a way that doesn't lock anything that's currently available to me behind a paywall, I'm fine with it. So for example, if I can use my machines and the slicers with their current cloud services without charge, but be offered some upgrades for a fee, then I'm fine with that. But locking anything away and then offering it back to me for a charge would be absolutely wrong. So I'm talking about additional storage for my slice files, for example, potentially cloud storage for non-slice files as well, because that could be quite interesting. And they'll just give me ease of access to everything to then do all my slicing within the cloud, which would be nice. You know, these are the sort of features that I see prosumers really liking and prosumers really taking advantage of. But like I said, if they lock anything behind a paywall that already exists to users, then I think that's just the wrong move. So that's my predictions for next year. So let me know what your thoughts are on the stuff that I talked about. Do you think I'm completely wrong? Do you think that I might be onto something? But also more importantly, let me know what you think might happen in 2026. I'd also be really interested to know what your wish list is for 2026. You know, some of these could be re you know realistic ones that you think could happen, but also some of them could be like pie in the sky stuff, things that you think you would love to see, but probably aren't gonna happen. Like I would love to see a perfectly safe and easy to work with resin that I can breathe in, that I can touch, that I can use, that's really flexible as well. It's not gonna happen, at least anytime soon, but I would love to see that, like really safe, easy to use resin. Ugh, that'd be lovely. Anyway, enough ramblings from me. Hope you've enjoyed that video. Hit the like and subscribe button, and hopefully I will see you in the next one. Take care.